That's a great day. All right. <laughs> The well, answer if you can't hear this, uh, you can at any point over there. Yeah, no, okay. Yeah. 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 I think that's way for it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's just a big ball thing. Very surface level correlation. Yeah, I thought it in, but that's just funny. I was like, oh, yeah, definitely looking okay. too far into that. Yeah. Any questions before we get rolling? That's wrong. Okay, so we're going to try to finish off this and maybe talk about a little bit about green managers today. Um, we're assuming uh, And we're kind of uh we're kind of at the end game of this. I'm gonna show you how it kind of boils down some ruins here. Uh here are the assumptions that we were under. Number one, P does not divide. So in other words, we'll, uh we're assuming that the solution that it, all the x, y's and z is relatively to P. Uh and two, uh we can assume that P is greater than or equal to five because we've already eliminated this case for three. We did that with some simple modular arithmetic mod nine. Um, ah, yes, keep forgetting the big one. Z adjoined with this guy, which is a primitive P through P, is a UFD. And for the last thing you add, Uh, doing five on five, I believe it was. Uh, it's only hypotheses x plus prime. If I is not equivalent to J mod P. So, in other words, as you run through the uh, P distinct powers of this P through unity, starting with zero and ending P minus one, so you'll get P of these things, they're all relatively prime. Um, so, uh, last time we kind of got a little bit of the start of this. Um, So last time, not then soon we can reduce down to the case that um, the divisor is. thing, which is actually, in fact, a prime element. I believe we showed this earlier. Um, so since product of x
So that product is ZP, uh, since X equals Y to P equals Z to P, we must have that this thing divides ZP. Now, of course, this is a prime, uh, and so, and this is the, uh, well, this is near disposable with U of D. So if this divides ZP, then of course it divides Z. Um, now note that Of course, once again, the freshman string comes out. This thing is equivalent to zero uh, mod P. And so, what does this mean? Well, this means that this is in alpha. It's visible by P, where alpha lives. I'm going to use mod P a lot, and it's not just going to be. So, when you say something uh, is equivalent to zero mod P, you mean that that thing is divisible by P. And the question is, what should the quotient be? It depends on where you're doing this, right? If, it, if it's over the integers mod P, that means this thing is an multiple P. But here we're in a uh, potentially bigger range, right? So, it means it's divisible by P with the quotient being in this larger. Uh, domain. So uh, notice that ZP over um, P alpha well of course one minus uh, a little tornado guy here by Z, so the P power by ZP, divide this by P alpha, this is some beta in the string as well. So if you look at ZP over P, this is alpha beta, right? Now what do I know about alpha beta? I know it lives here, Got both alpha and beta to, but it also lives here because it is a quotient of two integers. And this intersection is Z. That's actually fairly easy to verify. Uh, therefore, ZP over P is in Z. Therefore, uh, P divides Z uh, in the integers. And that concludes that bit. So now we've got this lemma that, that, that these P, as I run through the powers of this uh, root here, they, they're all relatively prime. Now, now we're going to use this. This is going to uh, basically get us kind of the crux of what we're looking for. So I'm going to give you kind of two equations here. So here's how we move forward. So, uh, Uh, by looking at this right here, um, what this means is Okay, so 
What this means is that, um, in fact, not just that one, I'm focusing on that factor here. But not just uh, not just this factor, but in fact, every one of the factors. <laughs> X plus Y, X plus tornado Y, X plus tornado squared Y. They all, since they're relatively prime, they almost be P powers, right? So I don't know much, but I know each one of these factors, in particular this one, is a P power of something, uh, of the unit uh, in this one, right? Okay. So using that, I'm going to appeal back to what we know about units. Uh, notice that U, So if you have any unit uh, in here, one of the things we showed that when you divide it by it's, it's conjugate, you get one of these first unity. Right. Well, I should say plus or minus uh, one of the p roots of unity. Um, because if you take the minus, it'll be two p through p and p actually. Um, so if you look at x, well, what is this? This is, and U is farther. And this is Um, let me justify this step a little bit, um, because what I've done is I've replaced R to the P by R bar to the P, right? Uh, let me give a quick justification of that. Recall that R, I don't know much about it, but I know it is, say, A0 plus A1, A. Uh, P minus one, right? I'm sorry, that should be P minus two, because that's what it means to live in this range on these, right? Now, if I take R of P, well, R of the P is the fifth power of this thing, so this is equivalent to A zero P plus A one. Dream and all, mod P. And of course, these are all P3 units, so they disappear. These are all integers. And so when I take the complex conjugate, so this is my justification for this. And so let me uh, dig out the last bit here. Um, this is plus or minus. Right, mod P. Okay, so 
sense. Uh, we have uh, two possibilities. Depending on my choice of sign. Uh, and I'm going to write this down here and keep it here for our records. So um, if you work this out, you get X plus. Equal to zero mod p. Or um, x plus. Plus so depending on your choice of sign, you get one of these two equivalences mod P. Now I'm going to go through and tear some stuff apart. And I think only in one case does it really matter that much which one of these are because they're very symmetric. Uh, but there, there's one where it's a little bit different. So we get these equations here, and we're almost dead here. By the way, can anybody, anybody see what? Well, let me be fast and loose here. What for most values of J, does anybody see the problem with this equation? Not going to be able to be zero on P since P doesn't divide X or Y. So you'll need them to cancel out. Right. Uh, well. In most cases, this violates the linear independence of one Uh, mod p. Uh, well, actually, let me not say mod p. Let me be more specific. Over c mod p. That, that's a little better. Uh, and the reason is, is x, y, as you pointed out, Grant, these are all integers. So you can consider this like um, uh, you can you can consider these elements of the field extension of z mod p. And these are actually linearly independent elements. So as long as these exponents are all different, we're done, right? Because this is a violation of linear independence of these roots of unity over C mod P. So when are we in trouble? When can some of the things double up? Well, we're only worried about the cases zero, one, two, and P minus one. Uh, so for example, um, if J is one, then these are not all different powers, right? Because you have the zero power here and the zero power here. And if J is zero, you have the zero power here and the zero power here. So you don't get that linear independence anymore. Uh, you sort of do, but you got to dig a little further, right? 
And so those are those are the only words. So let's let's kind of look at this in cases. Uh, it's also a call. We can assume that our prime p is at least five because we did the separate three case earlier, and that'll be convenient in my very last case. If If j equals p minus one, uh, we have x times one minus say one plus y times uh, minus. I guess that first equation. Uh, so this is what I get. Well, to get our perfect equation, I guess. And this turns out to be uh, this can be rewritten as um, like two x. Y times X times hours to uh, plus X minus Y and X to So take a look and see if you can figure out where that came from. But once we have this, once we have this relation here, note that for linear independence, uh, oh, for linear independence mod p. X must be equivalent to zero mod P. Because, for example, just look at the coefficient of the square term. Um, if J is zero, oh. If j equals zero, and the zero in two cases are similar across the board, I believe. Uh, we get, so if j equals zero, uh, I get this y times So, um, right, so that's using the first equation, of course, uh, that's, that's this. Now, as y is not equivalent to zero mod p, this means that this is equivalent to zero mod p. Uh, I'm sorry, it's minus one. And that means and once again, we've got a linear independence problem. This is similar for another equation. And for J two. Now the last case is uh, J equals one. 
So let's take apart J equals one here. What happens in the J equals one case? Well, um, in the first case, we give plus y and x plus y times okay got it right so this is from the second equation right when j equals one that reduces this now what happens uh in this case uh So since one plus uh, in this case, this is not uh, equivalent to zero one p. So Right. So in this case, you have x plus y is equal to zero minus p. So notice that x to the p plus y to the p is c to the p. So x plus y and this is equivalent to x plus y. P and so that is zero mod P. So Z to the P is equivalent to zero mod P. Therefore, P by Z. And, we, and the only case left is finally J equals one and equation one. What happens in this particular case? Well, in this case, uh, what we get is X times Um, notice that um, this thing actually divides P, right? In the in the ring here, here my mod P is back to doing the big ring Z joint with the the p through of unity, so I get x minus y is equal to zero mod um, one minus but these are integers, right, x and y are integers so uh, this exponent is at least one. That means that these these two are both. Uh, I'm sorry, they're they're equivalent. Their difference is divisible by p because it's an integer that's divisible by this thing. So it has to be divisible by p. X.
So as it turns out, x is equivalent to y mod p. Uh, now, what we have at this juncture is x and y have the same parity mod p. Parity is not the right part. They're, they're equivalent mod p. So start over. With y replaced by negative z. Well, I just rearrange the equation. Instead of x to the p plus y to the z p, x to the p plus negative z to the p is negative y to the p. Start over and do the whole shebang that we've done over here. If you get a contradiction in that case, fine. If not, you'll get down to this last case as well. Right. So if you start over with y replaced by negative z, if one of the earlier cases you throw it out, good for you. You're done. If you get all the way back here, then what you have now is we have x is equivalent to minus z. Uh, so here we go. Right, since we have solutions equation, zero is equal to this. And this is uh, equivalent to um, Right, because x is the same thing as y, and x is the same thing as negative c. So we actually get one, two, three x to the p's. Right, so three x to the p is equivalent to zero. But uh, three is not equivalent to zero mod p because. We're assuming that p was at least five somewhere. We did, uh, and x. And that's a wrap. So, any questions on that? So. Here's a here's a, here's where we've gone. What we've shown is so to kind of wrap this up here, summarize if you will. If P doesn't divide X Y Z uh, and Then there are no solutions to in this special case. Now, as I mentioned before, the boundary of this can be pushed a little bit further. You don't really need this to be a UFD. You can loosen it a bit. Uh, this, this assumption right here is probably a bit more important because the, the case where P divides one of the, one of the things is it's classically the, the much harder one. Um, but that's but this is interesting because I mean basically. What we get is under under this hypothesis that you have a, a UFD, uh, you can basically push this through by modular arithmetic if you want to play the game hard enough. Okay. Uh, and by the way, of course, for every prime that you get, 
you get every end that is a product of those primes and your set that you get. So, okay, any questions? So that's kind of my fun or traumatizing or whatever uh, introduction into, you know, why some of these equations are interesting in the ways of mind and so forth. Uh, now what I want to talk about, uh, so, So I'm going to do most of this without proof, uh, just so that we can get on to kind of the good stuff. Uh, rings of integers. I want to talk about uh, unit structure. Well, actually, I'm going to do that second. I'll do this order. I want to talk about one. And two, uh, the unit structure. Uh, both of these have fairly involved primes. I hope I'll give you kind of a, a good idea, but I, I probably won't go super in depth just because of time. Although, if you're dying to get under the hood, you're welcome to come see me with me to get under the hood. Okay, the first thing is, what is the ring of algebra? Right here? Okay, so. By the way, how many of you have heard this definition? Okay. Um, what? So I'm curious, then, what is, I mean, I bet you all know examples of ring of algebra, but do you know what ring of algebra is? Definition. Yeah, you should. Integral <laughs> closure of C and um, the number field. Okay, and what's the number field? Q join some. It's a finite dimensional uh, field extension. Okay. Right. A ring. Uh, by the way, some people look also at polynomials of the finite fields. So I'm going to ignore that for now. A ring of integers. What's <laughs> <laughs> well, it? I just got stabbed. <laughs> <laughs> what, well, that I'm ignoring them? It's okay. Yeah. Okay. It's time. Okay. It's here. Who can put that on? A ring of miniatures for now. <laughs> uh, is the integral closure. And I'm going to talk about integrality uh, later in a more general sense. Of Z in F, a finite field extension. Um, so there's some words. I, I think almost everybody's familiar with all the world. If you're not, that's that's okay. We won't fix that. So what we do is I like to make this diagram here. Here's my favorite range, Z, and its quotient field is Q, right? Now, what do I do? I take a finite extension, say a degree N, right? So remember, I mean, uh, over Q, you can basically adjoin a root of a single polynomial if you carefully choose the polynomial. So this is, this could be, you can construe this very easily as Q adjoined vowels for some appropriate complex number alpha. And then what do you do? You take the integral closure, this in here. So more precisely, R, this is what I mean by the integral closure, is all the stuff in F uh, such that, isn't it? Such that F of alpha is zero. So, Monic uh, 
Um, so what you do is uh, you take, basically what you do is you look at everything in this field that is the root of some polynomial with coefficients in Z. And that polynomial has to have one as its leading uh, coefficient, right? So, by the way, your monic polynomials can be all over the place. This has five roots. By the way, these roots, these polynomials are called irreducible over the rationals. Do you know why? You don't have to be an Eisenstein to figure that out. Uh, that's right. The first one is two Eisenstein, right? And the second one is five Eisenstein. Right? So they're irreducible polynomials. I don't know about you guys, but to me, it's not clear at all that if you take a random root of this and a random root of this and add them up that there's some other monic polynomial to root of. That's uh, patently not clear to me, right? Or the product, right? And and if you say, but of course it is, Jim, I might say, well, what's the polynomial then, right? So, right? Okay, good luck finding that. We'll actually prove that this is true now, but for, for here, we're just not going to say for now, that this actually does form a ring uh, and um, consisting of uh, all the roots of monic polynomials here, and this is the ring of integers. You need it to be the integral closure, the complete integral. Uh, uh, that's a bad choice, bad verb, but uh, you need the integral closure here. So, for example, What is the ring of energy? So this is very, this is sort of like the rational uh, complex numbers, if you will, right? Uh, let's see, I'm over here. Awesome. So, let's just do two extension. Um, let, me, let me point out the obvious is whatever the ring of integers is, this is certainly in it. <laughs> I can write down what monic polynomial is for this. And in fact, um, in fact, this should have two roots, and it should be complex conjugate answer, and you should get a, a, a plus or minus comes out, right? So it is true that everything in here is integral of Z, and all sides of the line are no, no. Here's a question. How do I know I've got everything? All right. Because sometimes it's a little tricky. So how about this? Then we'll close over here. Join one plus square root of negative three by x. So, uh, right. So, but let me be more Tennessee about this whole thing. Uh, what happens to this? Uh, 
I mean, I think we would all have to agree that this is the exact analog of what we did before, right? A Q adjoint of I. I is actually a root of a monic polynomial. It's root of like x squared plus one. Let's do the same thing here. But what happens now? Well, certainly if you have A plus B radical negative three is a root of I guess this would be something like a squared And you can test that with quadratic formula. So it is true that this is contained in the interval quotient. But my question is, is this everything? Jeez, I'm not your cue. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember what the actual polynomial is to get the additional stuff. Well, right. So, for example, that, um, that's a monic polynomial with coefficients and see, I think we can often agree with this. And if we look at the quadratic formula for, you guys really want me to post this on YouTube, we're sitting here in the nine <laughs> of course, but trying to remember the quadratic formula. Um, actually, I wanted that to be plus one, but it doesn't matter. Uh, actually, it really doesn't matter. So if you look at the quadratic formula here, what do you get? One minus four, two. And notice this is in Q, one square root negative three. So this is an element of this field that is a root of a monic polynomial. Right? So, uh-oh, there's more. So now this, this takes me back over here and gets me to worrying, right? Uh, is there more? Uh, and the answer is, uh, not for this one. So let me let me kind of give you something to kind of piece together. Uh, maybe I'll ask you about this. Maybe we should figure out anyway. Uh, here. Let uh, f uh, And what I mean by quadratic is just it's a degree two as a vector space of the Q. Then, number one, F is equal to Q square root of D, where D is a square free integer. That's kind of interesting that it's no more complicated than that. It seems pretty obvious, but you should probably think about that, right? Um, so any quadratic extension of Q, you can get it by adjoining the square root of some integer, as a matter of fact. And the reason you can get that, or even joining the square root of any rational number, is because of the fact that two is small, and we can always complete the square. What is more, integers of f equals q radical d is given by z joins the square root of d if d is equivalent to two or three margin. 
and Z adjoin one plus the square root of B over two. And D is equivalent to one mod N. And of course, the only thing left out is D is equivalent to zero mod four, but that's never square free. All right, so this covers the bound. This takes care of when D is uh, negative one. So the I case, that's equivalent to three mod four, and D is negative three is equivalent to one mod. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, we'll hit this up uh, next time. Any questions? Right. Well, I'm going to see you all on Friday. Right.